Hello, everyone, and welcome to Channel 781 News. Uh, this week in Waltham, there was a special meeting of the Rules and Ordinances Committee of the City Council to talk about pot shops, so we'll tell you about that. Uh, we took two weeks off from our regular news show because there weren't meetings happening, but there was one really important thing that happened in that time. Uh, Brenda Pena stepped down as principal of Waltham High School. So we don't have a lot of information on that, but we'll share what we do have. Um, another thing that happened during this time is we learned that there is a Waltham uh, critical mass group and that they are having their first event this weekend. And so we have a special guest here to talk about that, one of the co-founders of that group, Dan Sari. Hi, Dan. Hi, it's nice to be here. Dan is involved in a lot of community activism in Waltham and an old friend of ours, so we're glad to have a reason to bring him on the show. And of course, I'm also here with Chris Gamble. Hello. And James Kelly's. Hello, everyone. There's also a documentary uh, that's going to be premiering on Hulu that has a lot to do with Waltham, so I'll tell you a little bit about that. I also have an update on something we discussed in our last um, show about the fernal and the recreational plans for the fernal and how it came about that those are now approved by um, the Recreation Commission. Um, so I'll share some more information about that. Uh, first, let's do community events. Um, critical Mass is this Saturday, um, the 27th, 1130 to a.m. Um, to 1230 p.m., um, starting on the Common, and we're about to hear more about that. The Farmer's Market is ongoing on Saturdays. Waltham Arts Council Summer Concert Series is ongoing on Tuesdays, although I think this week's was rescheduled to Thursday of this week. Waltham Trail Runners meetups are ongoing. The primary is September 6th, and there are some vote ahead dates ahead of that. Waltham Day on the Common is September 17th. Um, the Recovery Festival is September 18th. The Phantom Gourmet Festival is September 24th, and the Motorheads Car Show is September 24th also. Um, this week, this Thursday at 10 a.m., there's a hearing about removal of trees. Um, and that and any of the other um, meetings I'm about to mention, you can find more details. These are from the bulletin board, so you can find more details in the picture of the bulletin board that's on our uh, Medium site. Uh, on August 30th, the Zoning Board of Appeals is meeting, and um, the early voting dates are the 27th through the 2nd. On each of those days, there are times for early voting, and you can find those details online. I'm going to go to Chris, who's going to give us a little bit more background about what is critical mass and why is it coming to Waltham. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you, Josh. Uh, so yeah, critical mass. Um, for those that don't know, critical mass is essentially a group bike ride um, around the city. Um, it began in the early 90s in San Francisco. Um, as a way of showcasing just how unsafe the roads were for cyclists and to show that roads are not just for cars. Um, and it is spawned across the world, um, but things, things like this have been going uh, on for a very long time. Um, it, it, the idea for Waltham um, came about because I had read an article about how the Netherlands had become such a bike friendly um, city. And it, the whole article uh, goes about goes on about the militant organizing that cyclists had to do because it didn't happen overnight. And it wasn't always a uh, cyclist friendly city. It used to be very car centric, it used to be very clogged up. And it was through years of militant critical mass type organizing of just people showcasing how unsafe the conditions were for people that don't drive. Uh, Waltham really has no bike advocacy groups. We need to start somewhere. We're not, the, the work that we're doing right now is not going to immediately see like separated bike lanes like Cambridge or Somerville, but we can plant the seed. We can, we can uh, start those conversations. And so I'm excited to uh, bring this to Waltham um, as someone that bikes everywhere. Um, and so uh, we created a committee and we created a map. Um, you can uh, pull that up in a second, but I'm going to let Dan take over and talk about what we're doing on Saturday and a little bit about why critical mass is important. Hey, thanks, Chris. 
on Saturday, we're going to muster on Waltham Common. Um, we're planning on leaving at 11.30 ahead of time. We're going to have people there, hopefully with swag and um, water bottles. Then we're going to leave as a group. We're going to have people leading the group and following up with the group with radios and reflective vests for visibility. And we are going to stay together and own the entire lane as we have a right to do as cyclists. Because we're in a group together, this is gonna be perfectly safe. We're gonna go at the pace of the person who's slowest in the group so that everyone can enjoy themselves together and have a nice little bike ride. We're gonna end up starting by going west on Main Street. Main Street in Waltham is notorious for cyclists being injured um, and killed. And um, this has never been a conversation point in the city before. Um, it, time and time again, people are injured either on the sidewalks or on their bikes and it's not been addressed. We are then going to turn right on Hammond Street, which is going to bring us right by the site of the new bike path that's working its way through Waltham. This is a great addition to the city and adds to our east-west connectivity. Um, with Waltham being a place that you can get to on a bicycle, the question is, what's it going to be like once you get here? We're going to double back on that, roughly shadowing the path, course of that bike path until we get to Lexington Street. And then we are going to move back towards the common, taking a left onto Main Street, finally taking a right onto Newton Street. This is a very common route for people to take when they are commuting and especially uh, any students who might be living uh, in the say bleacherly uh, neighborhood when they, if they were trying to get back from the new high school. They think that we're gonna demonstrate that this is an incredibly unsafe trip to take on your own and that it definitely needs to be upgraded for cyclists, particularly for students. We're gonna go down Newton Street. And similarly, that is another street that has lots and lots of commuter traffic and is just, you know, we, we took a test ride on this thing. I would say that that's the street that I felt the least safe on. There's no room for a car to pass to you, even as a single person, and they do get aggressive. Finally, we're gonna take a left on Cutter right after the spray park and work our way back towards the river where we will take the very relaxing and scenic Charles River Greenway back to the farmer's market and appreciate what cycling infrastructure actually looks like. I think it's gonna be a great ride. It should give people an experience who may not normally ride on the roads in Waltham for you know, various reasons, what it is like and why we tend to avoid it as well as showing us a great vision of what things could be like if we invested in cycling infrastructure. I grew up in Western Mass and um, getting around, like <laughs> my first girlfriend lived seven miles away from me through the hills and I bike to get there. You know, when kids are young and they don't have licenses, they will bike to get where they need to go. Uh, but I moved here, and while I use my bike to get around from time to time, I don't ride at night. There's a lot of streets I just don't ride on. Um, I think that Waltham has a lot of potential as a city that was designed before automobiles were a concept um, to really provide exceptional modes of transportation other than cars would really cut down our traffic and really cut down our carbon footprint and it would just make the city a much nicer place to live. I'm really excited about the work we're doing here at Critical Mass and I think that the comments that our Facebook advertisement of this event received are a great example of uh, the type of vitriol that you might face as a cyclist in Massachusetts for being on a bike um, there is a certain, you know, type of person who views the roads as strictly for the purposes of driving cars and um, any use for of the roads for something other than that, like a cyclist is seen as a violation and that this mild inconvenience um, can really set people off. And if you've, you know, commuted on a bike for any extent of time, well, you will have run into a person who has tried to injure you with their car. Uh, this is a pretty typical thing. Uh, it might 
you know, be a threat of it, which causes you to swerve and perhaps crash. Um, it might be an actual attempt that you can or may not avoid. Um, and sometimes you might even collide with a car for reasons that are entirely non-malicious. Uh, cars don't think to check for bikes on the side of the road. They just turn and, you know, that's, they could turn right into you. Um, or people opening their doors, uh, not, you know, to get out of the car, not seeing a car coming up on the road. Um, it's very common for cyclists to slam into car doors uh, because the rules of the road dictate that we're supposed to be right up to the edge of the road or, you know, face the wrath of the F-250s whizzing around. The, the need for a separated protected bike lane keeps cyclists off the roads from slowing down traffic for commuters. It keeps them off the sidewalks, which is a lot safer for people who are trying to get around by foot. And it makes traffic better. In case after case where people install bike lanes on cities, what happens is the car traffic is reduced. There is a number of people, a very large number of people out there who are simply prohibited from using bikes for their primary you know, means of commuting, not necessarily to work, but for errands, for getting to friends' houses, stuff like that, um, that would be completely removed off from car traffic if we had these separated bike lanes. And often in cases, the only thing that gets sacrificed is maybe a little street side parking, which I know people are very sensitive about, or turn lanes, which I think we can all agree are a nightmare on Main Street and pretty much incomprehensible to begin with anyway. So this could be something that Waltham could implement very easily, very minimal disruption, and incur benefits to cyclists, pedestrians, and to people who drive cars. I, I just think that this is a great project. I thought some of those comments were very telling, and I didn't really understand some of them, but most of them were like, we're all in agreement with each other. A lot of them were like, this is a terrible idea. I want to share a road with a bicycle. And I was like, yeah, me neither. I don't want to share a space with a car. I would like to be separated. Thank you very much. And so I think we're all kind of in agreement with each other. Uh, can I just ask, I just want to make sure I understand that. So if for the point of view of someone who would maybe never rides a bike. So if you're following the law as a biker, you're supposed to be in the middle of the road with the cars, right? But if you do that, many of the drivers will perceive you as you don't have a right to be there, uh, but you you don't really have another option. Is that right? Yes, yes. Uh, I used to commute, a great example of this is I used to commute um, to the bus stop on my bike. Um, and uh, I there's a particular stop sign that on the other end of it, the right side of the road is just full of potholes and there's no way to go over it safely on a bike. So in order to get through that stoplight, I would always stop in the center of the lane as the law dictates I am allowed to do. Um, and one day uh, a car pulled up next to me in my lane and the guy rolled down his window and he said, do you mind if I pull up next to you? And I said, yes, there's no room. Like I'm, I'm riding here. Uh, and he got furious. He started swearing at me. Just, I mean, yeah, it was a terrible interaction. I took a photo of his license plate and backed away because um, I didn't want something to happen to me at that point. But yeah, it to to ride by the rules of the road in, in Massachusetts, you drive like a car, um, and you share the road with cars that have blind spots tall enough to hide a child. Um, I think that one way that people often don't think about bike safety is that uh, it, it's often thought of in terms of like adults biking to work or wearing like Lycra and racing bikes or something. But where I grew up, it was children. Um, children were the people who biked. You don't see that here. The only place you see that now is Moody Street. Thank God the kids have a place to bike now. Um, well, that's that's interesting you mentioned that. So there's also been a lot of talk of kids on Moody Street and elsewhere um, riding down Moody Street in very unsafe ways or um, other complaints about their behavior. Um, what I'm do you moving, think? 
I'm yeah, what do you think, it. Walt? Would you do, do you think that um, that phenomenon could relate back to what Waltham actually provides for kids to ride on bikes? I would just say that Moody Street is like uh, it, it's the only place, right? Like there are so few things for children to do in Waltham, um, and one of them now is hang out on Moody Street and ride bikes. And like, yeah, if you make the only place where children can be safe your central commercial district, where people are walking around with like you know, kids and strollers, then you're gonna have some clashes there. Uh, but the fact that the children are out riding at all, I, I don't think anyone should be surprised that kids are being rowdy. Um, this is far, you know, very normal behavior and far preferential to many of the things that they otherwise might be getting up to. I just think it's funny that the older generation is like, kids don't go outside anymore. And now all I see on Facebook is like, kids are outside, please, please make it stop. So do people need to sign up to take part in the event or? They just... uh, no, no, we'll be um, behind City Hall parking lot, which is on the common um, at 1130. We'll probably say a couple words and then we'll be on our way. Um, free to free and open to anyone. And just to be clear, what this is totally legal. Yeah, so we're, we're expecting riding, we're riding that. that when people are re going to react as if it's we're doing something wrong. I think it should emphasize also that this is going to be safe. Like this is the entire point of critical mass is that this bike ride is going to be the safest bike ride you'll ever take because we will have a critical mass of people there to prevent us from having to worry about aggressive drivers. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. And we're going to cover the actual event. Uh, so we'll have some more information and footage from it for you next week. Okay, so moving on to our next story. Thank you very much, Dan, uh, which is a pretty disappointing story. Uh, a few weeks ago, um, Brenda Pena um, stepped down as principal of Waltham High School. This was reported and her, her resignation letter was printed on the WCAC website so you can read it there. Um, she had only been principal for a year and um, she didn't say exactly why she's stepping down. She just said basically she was doing what was right for herself and her family, which is understandable. And um, we since then learned that Mr. Daryl Braggs has been um, appointed as the interim principal. And he was the one of the people who interviewed for the role of principal a year ago. So we're fortunate we have someone qualified to step in, but this is still a big blow for Waltham schools. Um, uh, Ms. Pena grew up in Waltham. She started working in Waltham schools as a uh, adjustment counselor. She became an assistant principal and then she became a principal a year ago. And by uh, pretty much all accounts, this past school year has been the most difficult one ever not just in Waltham, but for many schools around the country and around the world. Um, so we don't know why um, she made that decision, what we, she did, but we do know that a lot of educators are feeling underappreciated, undervalued, um, undervalued in terms of pay, um, that this is a very stressful job and um, there's some frustration with the way that educators are being compensated in Waltham. Did anyone else have anything to add on this? Um, I just think, and I wish I knew more about this because it always seemed like uh, Brenda uh, was doing a good job and was happy. Uh, clearly, there's more of that story that I would like to know. But I, it, it sends weird messages about our education, about where we are in education in Waltham, where we have in the pipelines the most expensive school in Massachusetts history at the time. There's probably another one now. Um, but if you look at just like how the city council talked to our superintendent uh, a few weeks ago, um, when with Brenda retiring early and with the mayor uh, essentially uh, fighting over the contract uh, with the union, it's it's just an interesting place to be in. And, I'm, and I wish I knew more about the educational background of Waltham, but it sends a weird message that we have so much money to spend on a school, but we don't have the environment or the personnel to really allow students to thrive. And I don't know where where we went wrong. Turnover has been a problem nationwide just because of like ongoing COVID and everything else. But the 
at, at the end of the day, it's like a question of resources and yeah, spending all this money on property and improving like properties versus spending money on paying people to do the work in the first place. It's kind of, it, it's a, it doesn't feel like it's a big shock that we're seeing higher and higher level turnover following a relatively public fight over even funding the schools up to what the teachers felt they wanted. Yeah, and um, it's, you know, as we know from um, covering the budget process, you know, the just of the school budget is higher than it was last year, but the amount by which it was raised was justified in terms of that's the same percentage that our revenue is done. And that was it. So there was no acknowledgement that there was something exceptional going on right now, where there's a teacher shortage throughout the country, where we're asking teachers and administrators to do things they've never done before. And it was just kind of, we, we're going to do this process exactly how we've done it every other year. And I think that was probably disappointing for a lot of people. Um, Ms. Pena was someone who appeared to be really inspiring and helpful, at least to some of the students, because she spoke at Pride, and a lot of um, high school students and Mason alums were there mainly to see her. She um, had a big impact on them. So we wish her the best, regardless of what her reasons are. We totally support her. Uh, she seems like a very smart lady, and I think she's probably doing the right thing, even though I don't know any of the story. Um, and we would love to have her on to talk about it. Um, we are not asking right now because this is probably a huge disruption in her life and her career, and she probably doesn't have time to come on the show right now. But when she's ready to do that, we'd love to have her on to talk more about this and we wish her the best and uh, as disappointing as it is, uh, we totally support her decision. So another news item is there's a documentary that's coming out on Hulu that has a lot to do with Waltham. It's called The Murders Before the Marathon. Um, for those who don't know, in 2011, September 11th, 2011, there was a triple murder in Waltham. Three young people were found with their throats cut in a really brutal way. At the time, the police were inclined to believe it was a drug deal gone wrong and they didn't um, identify a suspect due to um, subsequent investigations. And we now know that it was committed by um, Tamerlan Tsarnaev, who a few years later would mastermind the marathon bombing um, and murder a police officer at MIT and then subsequently um, he was killed in a chase, a police chase in Watertown. And it appears that it was a hate crime. Um, two of the victims were Jewish. One was his former pot dealer. And it appears this was his way of proving his commitment on the anniversary of 9-11. This was his way of proving his commitment to violence or to his interpretation of um, Islam uh, as a reason for violence. And so it raises big questions that if, some, was there something that different that could have been done in that investigation that actually would have prevented the marathon bombing and prevented the murder of a police officer. So there's a journalist named Suzanne Zalkin who has been studying this for a few years and writing about it. And this documentary is based on her work um, murders before the marathon on Hulu starting on the 5th. I have a feeling it's going to generate some interesting conversations in Waltham, so you might want to check it out. So as I mentioned at the beginning, the uh, there was a special meeting um, this week of one of several over the summer special meetings of the Rules and Ordinances Committee to specifically to talk about uh, pot shops. So James, can you tell us what happened there? Yeah, so that was uh, attended by Darcy, um, Harris, uh, LeBlanc, um, Bradley MacArthur, and Paz. Uh, Bradley MacArthur and Paz were off committee. Uh, oh, and also uh, Pre President McMenamin as well. There, there was also uh, a brief hearing about the putting the antenna on the Marriott before the pot shops were heard. The general outcome for some of, the, some of them was getting sent to uh, the Committee of the Whole. Uh, there was an action from uh, related to one of them that actually apparently affected three of them, which was talked about at length with the one of the lawyers for the city. And that was uh, there's a um, apparently a center for um, uh, like a re rehabilitate like physical therapy rehab uh, that may potentially get, be used by children clients and. 
uh, for me to paraphrase what the issue was uh, in the original text of the uh, medical marijuana statutes at the statewide level, there was a carve out for within 500 feet of an area where children congregate. And I guess someone had written a letter to the city council uh, raising that this place was within 500 feet of at least some of the sites. Uh, the issue being with this is that at the uh, statewide level, when they passed recreational marijuana, they removed that restriction entirely from both. Uh, that was part of what was codified into the Waltham statutes, isn't present in the statewide statutes anymore. And essentially a lot of the exchange was uh, some of the counselors trying to sort of get the lawyer to give them a reason to vote no by saying that this is some this is you know yes or no within an area where children congregate and but to their, to their credit some of the counselors at least were po also poking holes in that ironically i think mcminnon was one of the ones that brought up that if their children are showing up for appointments it's not exactly a place where children congregate compared to like you know a day camp or something like that and I thought that was a good point to bring up. That got sent to legal, and I guess we'll have some kind of response from them on that. Nothing particularly remarkable about any of them, just a lot of process stuff about like, you know, making sure that trees are on the plans and things like that. And one of the shops, which I believe was the Main Street one, is going through an extra hurdle of needing another public hearing. So it's going to be doing that as well. And that's due to uh, changes on the part of the developers, like making last minute changes to the design, I guess. So, but also that means that they get to, counselors that were not present for their original public hearing aren't allowed to vote on them. So I believe this allows Kate's and uh, uh, Bradley MacArthur to be able to vote on them. So that's all, that's the procedural reason for why we had to sit through four to five hours of these hearings in the past, just so that people will be allowed to vote on them, despite the fact that not much had changed. I did not watch it, so thank you, James, for going and also recording it. And you can see this um, on Waltham Data's YouTube page if you're interested. Um, but the, I guess the only thing interesting to me is that some of them are going to committee of the whole. And so I'm curious why they're going to committee of the whole, why they need the opportunity for the entire council to give input on something. And also, it still needs to go back to ordinance and rules to approve the special permit. Um, so even if it's sitting in committee of the whole, it's gonna be several weeks before it makes its way back to ordinance and rules to approve a special permit. So we're still looking at weeks, weeks of this. And, and that thing with the, with the rehab center affects potentially three of them. And so depending on how that goes, that could affect how things get voted on. I just don't see why you need a lawyer to decide if a physical therapy place is a place where children congregate. It's not a place where anyone congregates, is it? People have like physical therapy parties or like- Well, also like part of the logic behind like a lot of the pod shops when they were first implemented having like reservations or uh, having to order ahead was specifically so people wouldn't be congregating. So a place that has appointments. Thank you for being there and thank you for live streaming it, James. If James had a live stream, there would be no record whatsoever of what happened. Same with a bunch of uh, uh, meetings this summer. So there's um, also one not posted except on their specific poster board. It's oh, this was on the, it was, yes, it was on the bulletin board, but it wasn't on the city yeah. website. At least I couldn't find it. So it wasn't on the calendar. You couldn't find it through the calendar. So some of the lawyers seemed a bit confused talking about it ahead of time too. So that was the, the, that was the impression I got at least. Well, that's actually a good transition into our next topic, which also has to do with transparency and meetings at the Fernal and the recreational meetings for the Fernal. We told you in our last show that the mayor put forward a plan for recreational amenities to the Fernal, um, which, uh, in some ways sounds like a good thing. It's a great open space and it's good that we're moving forward on using it. Um, but there've been a lot of concerns raised about it. For example, it has a lot of kids amusements on it. It kind of has an amusement park vibe. And is that appropriate for this site? 
Um, and there's not much information about details. There's an electric train on the plan. We don't really know what that is or why it's there. There is some reference to a memorial um, that appears to be just a, a, a sidewalk around. Uh, uh, yeah, we're not sure. We know that Mayor McCarthy in the past has supported, <laughs> James is reminding me, has supported monorail for Waltham. So we don't know if this, uh, something has to do with that. It sounds like maybe it's a kid's train, like you see it like in Conway, New Hampshire kind of amusement parks. And if it is, that I don't think that's a vibe we're going for with the Fernal. But you may remember that in the special meeting on August 1st, the mayor asked the city council and the historic commission for approval to take down some buildings at the Fernal, but she didn't ask them for this, their opinion on this plan. She considered it a done deal. She said the recreation board had already voted on it. And I was surprised to hear that because I've been following this pretty closely and I did not know the recreation board had met on this. Um, so I went online and I found out there was a special meeting on July 20th. And this was announced on the city website. Um, there's an agenda that was posted and on the agenda, it said park design, Nezra Engineering LLC. And that's the engineering company um, that is working on the Fernal. Um, so this is apparently the meeting at which they voted on it, but you wouldn't, it would, you wouldn't know that from looking at the agenda unless uh, you had been following this pretty closely. It also raised the question of whether this was posted on the bulletin board outside City Hall. We have a picture of the bulletin board that our volunteer took on the morning of July 18th and it wasn't there. So it may have been posted later that day, which means it would be within um, the 48 hour uh, limit. Uh, but what sounds like is one of two things, either it wasn't posted or it was posted at the last possible minute. Um, so I think this is a pretty egregious failure of transparency um, that the mayor seems to have gone out of her way to have this decision made in a, in a meeting that not many people were going to know about. And the reason I say that is because back in January, there was a public hearing about this sponsored by the Recreation Department where an engineer was there to present these plans or a prior version of these plans. And most of the people there were there to say that we, we, we're not ready to talk about recreational amenities until we know how the site's history is going to be memorialized. Now, that was my impression. Maybe other people had a different impression of what the consensus was. But no one in the public expressed support for this plan because the engineer never even had a chance to talk about it. Um, there were so many people who wanted to talk about respecting the history of this site. They also accepted written feedback. I don't know what the written feedback then. Um, since then, the um, head of the recreation department from that time, Mr. Bruzzi, has left that role. I don't know if that has anything to do with the fernal, but I, I learned that when I was researching this. And uh, so it seemed pretty clear to me that the city asked for an opinion on this plan from the public. The public was not okay with the plan. And then eight months later, seven months later, um, the mayor has the Recreation Commission voting on it in a not very well publicized meeting. So I, it seems to me like she did an end run around her voters. The other reason I think this is egregious is because of what it's at stake with the Fernal. The number of people who know about the history of the Fernal, the number of people who are interested in the history of disability is only increasing. It's increased a lot in the past few years, largely because of Alex Green's work and other people's work to draw attention to it. And so in the future, a lot of people will know what Fernald was. And if there's a perception that it was reused in a disrespectful way, that is a problem that's going to keep coming up every time anyone proposes doing anything at the site. Um, the other problem is that if these amusements are not well utilized, and it's been pointed out there are other stuff for kids in that area in North Waltham, um, it could become a really creepy place. Um, and uh, one way of thinking about it is Fernald is actually already possibly one of the top tourist attractions in Waltham because there are urban adventurers, urban explorers who sneak in there to take pictures, and there are sites online for people who do that kind of thing. And so imagine, you know, in the future, seeing a blog post, go check out the creepy amusement park that a city built to cover up 
a concentration camp for disabled people. I think that's the kind of thing we're going to be running into in the future um, if this moves forward in the wrong way. So this is the kind of decision where the community really should have been more involved. And she went out of her way not to involve the community. So I posted about this on Reddit and people asked, well, what can we do? I don't know what we can do because she considers this a done deal. It may be that she still needs to ask the city council to vote on it to get the funding. But it may be that if the funding has already been allocated to the recreation department somehow, I actually don't know the answer to that. Uh, so we don't know if the city council gets to vote on it. The city council could use the leverage given to them by this other thing she's asking them for um, to try to have a conversation about it. But that's rare for the city council to do, to push back on something that the mayor is pushing this hard. Um, but I would encourage people to talk to their city councilors. It's a long shot that we're going to change this plan, but we really should try because otherwise I could see us having protests at the Bernal 5, 10, 20 years from now, every time somebody tries to do with this site, you know, do something with this site because we didn't do it right to begin with. One, one of the things that's interesting too about the use of it is that it is just a lot of, there, there's only a few access roads and it's in a relatively remote, remote part of Waltham. I have to assume they'd also have to include a fair amount of like police details and stuff like that in the area to, just to make sure people aren't hanging out there after hours and things like that. It just feels like a, very odd use of the site, but the one of the other things that was interesting that I think you brought up was that it was part of how it was acquired. It it, it is retained remained in possession of I think the city, uh, which is which is not supposed to be the case, and that is also potentially affecting how they're spending money on it. So I it, it, it's also interesting because I guess that that. Being in, as we've talked about, being in violation of the law affects your ability to get like future grants and stuff. Some a lot of the time, so I'd be interested to find out more about like what's going on with how we're spending money on this. Yeah, another thing I found out when I followed up on this, uh, which you just referenced, is so in um, the August first meeting, one of the members of the historical commission asked to see uh, studies that had been done on the site when it was being considered for use as a high school. And he, the mayor said he should already have them. He said he didn't. And she said she'd check with Justin Barrett, who's the head of the CPC, about it. And I thought that was interesting um, because so the CPC is the committee that, for those who don't know, that spends a special pot of money that can only be used for community housing, historical um, preservation, or open space. And open space can include recreation. And that committee paid for a big chunk of the um, Fernald purchase, not all of it, but a big part of it. And that was years ago. So I was surprised to hear they still play a role. So I look back at the minutes from their meetings this year. And yes, they do still play a role for two reasons. One, James mentioned they had a guest speaker in earlier this year from the statewide organization that advises CPCs. And he told them that Waltham is out of compliance with the Fernald and several other properties that are not supposed to be owned outright by the city. When they're purchased with CPC funds, they're supposed to be transferred to a third party that manages them long-term. And Waltham hasn't done that. And this person, this guest speaker advised them to hire a lawyer, said we can use some of the CPC money to hire a lawyer to create, help create and transfer to these entities um, and take care of it. And Mr. Barrett's response was that if we were to do that, the city law department wouldn't approve of those contracts. So um, the guest speaker said, well, in that case, Waltham is, you know, in violating the law. So it wasn't really clear how that was going to be followed up on. Another time that it came up is uh, someone on the CPC mentioned that in their budget summary, there was a line item for demolition of buildings at the Fernal, and they didn't remember the CPC voting on that. And it was explained that that was a mistake that the mayor had asked for that at the same time and it accidentally ended up on the CPC budget, but it was gonna be moved. It was kind of odd because there was also supposedly a mistake about getting the information to um, the historical commission member. Um, but Justin Barrett, the reason that's concerning to me that the CPC is involved in this is because Justin Barrett, who's the head of the CPC, is also very involved in the Lions Club. I don't know his current role, but he at one time was the head of their charitable foundation. And the Lions Club holds the light show on the Fernal property, which as far as I know is the only 
use of the property that's ever been allowed. And there have been protests um, against that light show. And it was actually very well publicized about two years ago. It got written up in the Globe. And as far as I know, neither the Lions Club nor the mayor ever responded at all to those protests. They never said anything about why they thought it was okay. They just ignored this. Um, Justin Barrett is also the chair of the board of WCAC, which as I've discussed at length, does not um, caption their content, um, which I think is a violation of federal law. And I've emailed him to him about it and I haven't heard back. So I think this is someone who does not have a good record of listening to the voices of people with disabilities or their advocates in Waltham. And this is not someone who should be playing a big role behind the scenes. Um, and determining what's going to happen with the furnace. So, second thing, like how convenient it seems that the only use that's been allowed for the furnace has been for one of the organizations that the guy that doesn't actually own the property chairs, but has been facilitating the city keeping ownership of, despite the fact that they're in violation of the law in doing that. So it seems like a very sweetheart kind of relationship. But I mean, what do I know? He got the Ritzy Award. Yeah, and, and we know he received an award from the city council earlier this year for his service and a not very transparent process that we talked about. He's on a, plays a lot of roles in town, seems to be a proxy for yeah. the mayor. And I think, you know, we should to look at him more and look at the other people who the mayor appoints to boards more as we get closer to the mayoral election next year. All right, I think that was our last topic today. Thanks again, Dan, sorry for being here. Thank you, Chris and James, as usual. Uh, we will hopefully see many of you at the Critical Mass event this weekend, and we'll be back next week to tell you more about it. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye, everyone. Adios. Yeah.